All right, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, Dmitry Operovich. Mr. Operovich is the co-founder and chief technology officer of, for CrowdStrike Incorporated, a leading provider of next generation endpoint security, threat intelligence, and incident response services. Of note, in 2016, he revealed the Russian intelligence agency's hacking of the Democratic National Committee servers. Please welcome Mr. Dmitry Operovich. Is there a clicker here? There is. Oh, perfect. Fantastic. All right. Thank you so much for having me back at SciCon. I was here a few years ago, had a great time, and uh, great to be back with you, this time as your resident Mythbuster. Today I will talk about the, what I view as the top 10 myths of cybersecurity. I've been in the industry a long time, and over the years, it's been great to see that more and more people are now focused on cybersecurity and are talking about it. In fact, uh, later this afternoon, I'll be testifying in the Senate on this very issue. We've seen a sea change of interest from policymakers and many others in this topic. Unfortunately, it has also brought a lot of people into this industry talking about this industry that don't know a whole lot about it, and that has created a problem for us in that we've had these myths that are being perpetrated by various people they're not actually doing cyber, and I thought it would be nice to actually do some myth busting for a change and talk to you about what I view as some of the key things that uh, we need to get over. And some of these myths are actually very dangerous and are holding progress in our field. So let's begin with what is the real threat that we face in cyberspace? I would argue to you that it's actually this. Uh, this is an anthropomorphic expression of that threat created by artists at CrowdStrike but effectively representing our adversaries that we at CrowdStrike use a um, tongue-in-cheek naming scheme for it, leveraging animal, animal themes. Uh, but the point of the, the, the message here is that the adversary really is the nation states that we're facing in this battle. And from US and European perspective, it is certainly China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. I've actually argued for many years that we don't actually have a cyber problem. What we do have is a problem of Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea, of which cyber makes up uh, a certain uh, set of that problem. But it's, the, the reality is that this is inherently a geopolitical issue, not a technology issue. So let's start with myth number one. You hear this a lot, and unfortunately, uh, this keeps coming up, that attribution is impossible in cyberspace. It is so hard because the adversary can obfuscate where they're coming from, tracing back through multiple computers, and they can do false flag operations and all, all the rest of it that comes with that particular argument. Of course, it is false, plainly false, based on the facts on the ground. The fact of the matter is that over the last 30 years, almost every major attack of consequence has been attributed, many of them publicly, some of them privately, by governments and private sector organizations. But the fact of the matter is that we're extremely good at actually identifying who's behind the attack, not just which country they're operating from, but who's behind the keyboard, which intelligence or military agency they work for, which criminal organization. And in fact, many of these people are now getting indicted. In the last several years, the United States Department of Justice has indicted hackers from Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. In fact, just a few weeks ago, they've actually managed to lure out of China for the first time ever uh, an officer of the Ministry of State Security, the Chinese intelligence agency, to Belgium, get him arrested, and extradite him to the United States. Unprecedented action on the part of the Department of Justice. So we're getting very, very good at understanding who the threat actors are. Despite that, this myth persists, and I would argue that it's actually a very dangerous myth because more and more it is now being perpetrated, uh, promoted by our adversaries, um, countries that we are attributing on a daily basis, and they're trying to obscure that uh, attribution and claim that no, 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 this is impossible to do. Um, no one can do attribution in cyberspace. It can't possibly be us. The reality is the way attribution is done in the cyber domain is very much the same as it is done in the physical world. When you're dealing with a bank robbery, you don't arrive at the scene of a bank robbery in our country, the FBI, that investigates bank robberies, and you don't say, well, unless there are tracks of the getaway car that lead to the bank robber's house, there's absolutely no way we can identify who possibly have done it, right? That's not how this works. They do forensics, they look at 
the, the motivation, they look at how this is done, the tradecraft of the attack, and they try to map it to past cases they have seen because bank robberies are typically not done once by a criminal group and they never do it again. They tend to repeat it over and over again, just like in cyber, particularly from a nation state perspective, particularly from a criminal organization perspective. Once they build a capability, they don't use it once and, and forgo it. They tend to use it over and over again because once you've made that investment, that significant investment in resources and people, training and so forth, you're gonna leverage it for many operations going forward. And that is the weakness that all of these organizations have, that it makes it much easier to attribute them over time as they continue to execute these operations and occasionally make mistakes. Because after all, everyone's human, everyone makes mistakes, and when you do repetitive tasks, you're more likely to, to make mistakes. I would argue that attribution is not even a new field. The very first major attack that we had seen in cyberspace was written in a wonderful book by a gentleman named Cliff Stoll that you see on the stage there with me, myself. And uh, he wrote a book, Cuckoo's Egg, if you have not read it, highly encourage you to read it, the best book I think ever written on cyber. Because back in 1986, when he was an astronomer at Berkeley Laboratories in California, he identified a hacker breaking into his network and almost single-handedly, without help from really the government at the time, who was completely uninterested in investigating that hack, he managed to trace it back to hackers in Germany that were working on behalf of the Stasi and closely with the KGB trying to steal US military secrets back in 1986. Attribution was possible then. It is much, much easier now. Myth number two, and this is for the Europeans in the room, that privacy leads to security. In fact, the concepts are obviously very much related, but they're not the same. And in fact, some of the things that we're seeing in the field of privacy and trying to enhance privacy are detrimental to cybersecurity. When we're trying to protect the adversary of the bad guys, when we're trying to say that an IP address is private information that cannot be shared, when we're trying to limit who can do forensics on machines that have been hacked, all those things are detrimental to cybersecurity. Unfortunately, some of the legislation, some of the regulations we're now starting to see across the world are making us less safe because they're overly focused on privacy without realizing that security and privacy needs need to be balanced. And in fact, when you don't have security, you have no privacy. Uh, and uh, that's an important point that many, many people still do not, unfortunately, realize. Myth number three. This is the one that I hear a lot. We really need to focus on protecting critical infrastructure, our electric grid, our water su supply systems, and so forth. I actually don't spend my time worrying a lot about critical infrastructure here in the United States. I will quote uh, General Hayden, one of the most brilliant thinkers, I think, on this topic, to have been in the United States government, who has said that if the United States suffers a catastrophic attack, cyber attack on our electric grid and power is shut down, that won't be the first, second, or even third thing that gets briefed to the president that day. If something like that ever to, ha were to ever happen, and it is possible, technically, chances are we're at war, millions of people are dead or about to die, and power going out is an important problem, but probably not the most pressing uh, situation that's taking place in the country at that moment. The reality is that to have an overwhelming effective attack that's long lasting on the power grid is very, very difficult. And is really the, uh, only the purview of a few nation states that are out there. Should those nation states launch an attack like this? One, there's probably gonna be a geopolitical reason behind it, and we'll know very quickly who's doing this and why, probably without even needing to do technical attribution because there'll be other things happening in the geopolitical context that will lead us to, to thinking about this problem in a particular way. However, if that were to ever happen, those nation states will know that there will be kinetic retaliation against them, that we will view that as an act of war, and we will respond accordingly. As a result, I, I would argue that despite the fact that for many decades now, there have been countries that have been capable of doing devastating attacks like this against us in cyberspace, the fact that we had not seen it, the fact that for the last 30 years we have talked about the cyber Pearl Harbors and the last 20 years cyber 9-11s, the fact that we have not seen them, I would argue, is, is a demonstration of effective deterrence. In fact, if you think about it, we've been talking about 
the term cyber Pearl Harbor about half of the time that has uh, been since the real Pearl Harbor, and we have yet to see one, and I would argue probably unlikely to see one in the future, unless we're involved in a major kinetic conflict with one of the other great powers. So while critical infrastructure should certainly be a focus, I would argue that it should not be the sole effort for us. There are other things that are happening in our countries in terms of intellectual pro uh, property theft, criminal activity, information operations that are literally happening on a daily basis that we are often neglecting because we're too overly focused on this issue, this hypothetical problem. Myth number four, information sharing is the answer. I probably hear about this one every single day. Someone is saying, you know, the way to solve cybersecurity is more information sharing. Well, first of all, I would argue that we shouldn't be sharing information, we should be sharing intelligence, and there's a big difference between the two. But the fundamental problem with information sharing or intelligence sharing is that it doesn't actually scale. When you start thinking about this nation or countries in Europe, the vast majority of the organizations that are getting attacked wouldn't know what to do with this information if you hit them over the head with it. They don't have the capabilities, they don't have the personnel, they don't have the training to actually do anything about it. That's problem number one. On the use side, very few can actually benefit from it. Problem number two is it doesn't actually scale on the sharing side either. Because to share intelligence, presumably sensitive intelligence that can jeopardize sources and methods, that can burn uh, intelligence, you need to have trust. And trust is not transitive. Just because I trust a friend here doesn't mean I should trust his friends. And inevitably what I've seen is as these information sharing relationships grow, trust breaks down. People that started talking together in a small group of friends where everyone knows each other, everyone has trust that they will not get burned, suddenly a few years later they will look around the room and there are 50 new faces that they don't really know, don't really trust, and they stop sharing and they climb up. And I've seen this in time and time again in all kinds of information sharing groups. So I would argue that while important, this is not going to solve our problem in cybersecurity um, and really doesn't scale to, the, to protecting the nation, to protecting most of the organizations that are out there. Myth number five. I had a debate on this in 2011, shortly after the discovery of Stuxnet, with a good friend of mine, Ralph Langer, who uh, did some of the great work on reverse engineering and trying to understand Stuxnet. And he and I did a debate at Brookings Institute where he argued that now that Stuxnet was out there, the sky is going to fall. We're going to see attacks on ICS systems every single day, not just uh, nuclear facilities, but manufacturing floors, electric grids, all of that is going to be uh, thrown into chaos just because Stuxnet was out there as a blueprint for others to execute attacks. I argued the opposite, that um, the status quo would pretty much remain. I'll let you judge who proved to be right. But um, the challenge, of course, is that cyber tools, exploits, malware, implants, are software. And software is not that easy to replicate. Just because you have a copy of Microsoft Word on your machine does not mean that tomorrow you can easily replicate it, right? Particularly complex systems, systems that you don't know a whole lot about, which is really the case for ICS systems that are really only maybe a, less than 1,000 people in the world that actually know how to program these systems at a deep enough level to actually write sophisticated tools to uh, destroy them. It's not that easy to take one system that works for a Siemens controller that's controlling a power plant, uh, centrifuge plant um, in the Tans and apply that to attacks on something entirely different, right? It's sort of like saying if you're a great programmer for Apple II, you can easily write Windows uh, code. Very, very different. And that is why we're actually not seeing that much of a proliferation of these cyber tools. Just because you've seen how someone else does it does not easily mean that you'll be able to apply the same thing. Maybe you'll start thinking about the problem in a particular way. Maybe it'll give you new ideas but it's not immediately going to be applicable to other things you're trying to do. Myth number six, this is a solvable problem. This is more often cited by people that are outside of our industry. I recently had a, 
uh, dinner, fascinating dinner with one of the leading thinkers in Silicon Valley that is not a cybersecurity person, but one of the technology leaders, a name that you would all very easily recognize. We're talking about various problems. Uh, we're talking about self-driving cars, something that I don't know a whole lot about. And um, I was learning from this individual about how we are actually still many, many years away from having self-driving cars that can drive in the cities because of all the numerous technical problems that still need to be solved in that particular domain. And then the conversation turned to cybersecurity. And this person was, uh, was telling me that oh, in a couple of years, we'll solve this problem with artificial intelligence. Well, the problem that we have in cybersecurity, I would argue, unlike any other problem that we have in any other area of technology, is that we're facing a human opponent, a sentient opponent that is looking at everything that we're doing. And I'm, if they have the motivation and the capabilities and the resources, they're going to find a way around any defensive measure that we put in place. And that problem of facing that human attack is something we don't face anywhere else in technology. Someday, I'm confident, we'll figure out self-driving cars. The rules of the road do not change by an adversary that, that is looking at how we're building self-driving cars and trying to impact our ability to do so. We do face that problem with cybersecurity. And I would argue as long as we face the enemies out there that are trying to do us harm, we will um, continue to, to, to face a problem with cybersecurity. Myth number seven, offense is easy. I often hear it from people that don't, have never done offense. The reality is that offense is in part software engineering, which is hard, and particularly software engineering without able, being able to do realistic quality assurance when you're building tools and you're trying to deploy them on target, but you don't have an exact copy of that target, really, really hard problem. To try to do, make sure that it will be done correctly. It will not fail in a way that will alert the uh, defenders to your presence. Very, very hard problem. And increasingly becoming harder as operating systems are becoming much more locked down. When you look at the mobile ecosystem, for example, the average price of an exploit for an iOS platform is half a million dollars way more than an exploits for Windows and, and other platforms on the black market. The bar for entry is becoming higher and higher, and we're seeing less and less capable actors out there that are able to actually execute these attacks at scale against hardened targets. Myth number eight, on a cyber defensive front, it is all about hygiene, it is all about keeping the enemy out, the reality is those things are important. You will never succeed against a capable, dedicated adversary by practicing cyber hygiene or trying to keep them out of your network. The reality is when you're facing a foreign intelligence service, they may already be in because they may have already recruited an insider in your network as an asset. As we've seen in a recent indictment from the Department of Justice, the Chinese have practiced this really well when they would recruit people to plug in a USB drive in the machine and execute malware from it, and that's how they would get into the network. We've seen the Russians being arrested in Netherlands on doing physical access operations, driving up to the building that they're trying to hack and using Wi-Fi and other methods to try to get in with close proximity to the, to the target and enabling remote access uh, back to Moscow from that building. That's what you're dealing with, uh, with when you're facing those types of threat actors. And if that's the threat you're facing, which is not for everyone, but for organizations that are facing a nation state, a capable nation state adversary, you need to think about a different strategy. And that strategy, I believe, is hunting. You need to start with an assumption, they're already there, and you need to hunt for them 24 seven, thinking like them, if I were them, where would I be, how would I hide, how would I move laterally, and trying to test these hypotheses on your network to figure out if they're already there and kick them out as soon as possible. Myth number nine. Cyber attacks are done at the speed of light. We actually decided to test this hypothesis um, because we keep hearing it so much, but we wanted to understand how long does it take for adversaries to actually move around the network. And at CrowdStrike, we looked at about 25,000 breaches that we worked on last year, and we started looking at how long does it take for an adversary to break out uh, of the initial machine that they've established, the beachhead that they've established within the network, by getting someone to click on a link or visit a malicious website, whatever the, the initial compromise vector may have been, how long did it take them to break out of that beachhead and spread to other resources within the network? And what we re, uh, discovered is that it was almost two hours, an hour and 58 minutes. Certainly not the speed of light, 
but certainly also means that you do not have days and weeks to sip coffee and uh, try to figure out where the, the adversary is. And based on that data, we came up with a model that is a metric about how you can actually judge the efficacy of your cybersecurity problem, uh, program. This is one of the things that I face all the time when I talk to boards of directors and CEOs of companies that are asking me, Dimitri, how do I know that my CISO is doing his job? How do I know that, or her job, how do I know that they have enough resources, that they have enough people? How do I know that I'm good enough? And of course, good enough means different things for different companies based on the threats that they may face. But the one thing that I keep telling them is, you know that your sales team is good enough based on the fact that they make their quarterly numbers or yearly numbers or not, right? You need similar outcome-driven metrics in cybersecurity. And too often, I see chief information security officers go into boards of directors and present a laundry list of projects that they're working on. Implement two-factor, do this, do that, improve patching. And that has no relevance to the board. That has no relevance to the executive team because they have no idea whether that's actually going to solve their problem, whether that's going to drive measurable improvements in cybersecurity, and how do they know that it's going to be successful at actually improving the posture of that organization. So based on that, I came up with these three metrics, call it the 11060 rule, which really is all about the key thing that we have in cyber about how we defeat this adversary, which is speed. How do you quickly detect a threat, investigate it, and remediate or kick them out? And what I argue to organizations, um, some of the best that we work with, is that they should focus on average, so there'll be outliers, but on average, you should detect an attack in one minute, investigate it in 10 minutes, and kick the adversary out in an hour. If you are that fast, as we've seen from the previous slide, if it takes them two hours to break out of that initial beachhead and access critical resources within your organization, you're gonna prevent a breach. It is all about speed. Now, not everyone is gonna be able to meet the 11060. Not everyone, I would argue, even should, because not everyone is facing that sophisticated threat actor. But what you can do is you can start measuring each one of those metrics. You can start measuring for real incidents that you have in your organization. You can also start measuring them for simulated incidents or red team exercise that you have, or you should have, against your organization and start looking at the trend lines. So as you're implementing that next cybersecurity project, as you're spending more money, hiring more people, is the trend line going up or down? If it is not going down, you're not doing your job, or you're wasting your money and the resources that the organization is giving you. So it's a great way to keep people accountable and actually see how you're doing in comparison to others as well. All about speed. And lastly, and, and then I'll open up for questions, I like to leave, uh, leave you on an optimistic note. So often you hear, well, this is just the sky's falling. This is getting worse and worse. It is all hopeless. I would argue that we've come a long way. And I was recently talking to an intelligence officer in an in allied country that is practicing offense. And he was telling me how much harder his job has become because the level of security in targeted organizations that he's going after has gotten so much better how it used to be a free-for-all, where he would go in a decade ago and stay in that network for years, knowing that no one would ever detect him, no one was even looking for him. That's not the reality today. We're making his job a lot harder, we as an industry, and um, the dwell time for adversaries, being able to persistence in networks is going down. It's not where it needs to be, but we're making massive progress. Attribution is getting a lot easier, Accountability for threat actors is getting a lot easier. They're no longer staying anonymous. We're outing them. We're indicting them in the West. Whenever they travel overseas, they now have to worry about extraditions and arrests. That is a huge sea change from where we were, I would argue, even five years ago. So big progress has been made on this issue. Do not be hopeless. Do not think it's hopeless. We are making a difference, and I would urge all of you to fight the adversary together and, uh, and beat them at this game. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Do we have uh, time for questions? Yeah, perfect.
How do we want to do this? Is there mics around, going around? Maybe if you raise your hand, we'll have a mic come around. Does that work? Yeah. If you raise your hand, have one of the, uh, the, the mics. All right, there we go. Right. Good morning, Dimitri. Good to see you. The audience, Forrest Hare from SAIC. So uh, Jason said he has some issues with your presentation. <laughs> no, but, but seriously, I do have a question. He always does. <laughs> I do have a question for you. Um, as provocative as the list is, I would suggest there might be a couple paper tigers in there. Uh, let me just um, uh, bring up one of them there, is the information sharing is the answer. So, of course, when you're engaged in all or nothings, it's easy to say, yeah, that's, that's probably not gonna be the answer. But uh, are you saying that we shouldn't improve our efforts in information sharing or, ways to, or look at ways to overcome those issues with trust? Because I think there's probably some work to be done there and probably some work that we, that we really need to do there to figure out how to share intelligence uh, while addressing the trust challenges. I would argue that it's a fundamental problem with uh, trust, trust not being transitive, trust not scaling. Um, look, there's always a million things you can be doing that will measurably improve things. Information sharing is one of those things. I would argue one of the problems we've had in this industry from a defensive perspective is we have not been able to prioritize. A typical organization cannot focus on a thousand things, or any organization, right? If you're focusing on a thousand things, you're not focusing on any. And you need to start prioritizing on what is most effective. Cyber hygiene is a great example. I'm gonna be testifying, as I mentioned, in the Senate later this afternoon. I'm gonna be telling them that DOD's focus on cyber hygiene, almost exclusively to, um, um, to the exclusion of everything else, is detrimental to the mission of the Department of Defense. The reason for that is that who is their primary adversary? It is not some criminal group that is breaking in to steal some credit cards. It is China and Russia. It is the PLA and it is the GRU. Those organizations are not going to be stopped by cyber hygiene. So you need to focus on the fact that they're already there through human assets, through other types of attacks. You need to find them and kick them out as quickly as possible before they do great damage um, to, to the networks. So that's just one example, but I argue that we need to start focusing on the things that matter the most once you've done those things, once you're great at them, sure, do everything else, start going down the list, but you can do 100 things and expect to, to have any, any effect. And information sharing falls into one of those for me. Great question. Thank you, Jay. Sir, Spence Calder, um, I'm with the Army, obviously. Um, question, so uh, deception, use of deception in um, <clears throat> average approach to cybersecurity, not very prevalent right now. Um, what do you think the impact of um, a robust deception capability would have on your 11060 rule, sir? Great question. So I would argue very few organizations out there can actually do deception well. Um, and, and deception is, again, one, uh, one of those things that falls into the bucket of if you've done everything else and you, you, you have extra time, extra money, uh, you're bored, sure, let's go do deception. Uh, very few are in that uh, in that bucket, right? And uh, the reality is that it takes a lot of effort and not just technical effort, but thinking about what the adversary cares about and how to actually uh, fake, uh, fake them out um, to, to practice deception really, really well. So um, I would say um, this, is not, this is one of those shiny new objects that a lot of people are focusing on. In reality, in real intrusions I've seen, very rarely does an adversary actually fall for it. Um, and uh, it doesn't actually help you speed, speed anything up. Other questions? Yes. <clears throat> Hello, thanks for your talk. Near the beginning you said that we don't have a cyber problem, we have a Russia, Iran, China, and Korea problem. North Korea. And North Korea, yes, of course. Or indifference. <laughs> um, to me it seems like that is a dangerous message to be spreading because it creates a cognitive bias that would make us slower to recognize and respond to new threats from new sources, which it seems that in such a rapidly evolving field, the idea of new threats from new sources should be pretty critical to stay aware of. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Great question. So 30 years ago, you know what our main cyber threat actors were? China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. Same threat actors we have now. You know the reason for that? because they're our main adversaries in geopolitics. Is Singapore, does Singapore have significant cyber capabilities? Absolutely. Do I spend my time worrying about what they may do to this country or our allies? No, for very obvious reasons. The reality is that until the geopolitical situation changes and cy uh, cyber is very much driven by geopolitics, those threat actors will not change either. So we have actually not seen new actors emerge 
in this domain from the West perspective, right? If I were living in Pyongyang, I would have a very different representation of who my top enemies are. But we're living in the West, and we face certain types of adversaries. That is why I say those are the main threats that we face in cyber. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much again. I really appreciate the time. <laughs>